right, I'll get started then. Uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is June 6, 2022, and I call this meeting to order. So uh, our main order of business today is to approve more licenses. Um, and once again, these will be primarily to social equity applicants and women in minority-owned businesses. Um, I know that it can be frustrating to hear this if you do not fall into one of these groups. But um, I do encourage everyone listening to keep in mind the journey it took to get us to this point um, and the highly destructive war on drugs, which preceded it and still reverberates um, in our communities today. You know, a popular refrain from the 80s and 90s um, was that cannabis is a gateway drug, um, when in actuality, what we saw is that convictions for cannabis-related offenses are gateway convictions into involvement with the criminal justice system. And once you're in, um, it's very difficult to get out. There's a negative feedback loop that happens um, when you have a criminal conviction on your record. Um, you're disqualified from voting in federal elections. You're ineligible for any number of professional licenses. Employers and landlords look down on you. And, um, you know, good luck getting into college or um, getting any sort of financial assistance or a bank loan. So um, all of a sudden, um, the only opportunities available are illegal enterprises. And this sort of and a negative spiral has replayed itself tens of thousands of times in Vermont alone. Um, and it's also had intergenerational impacts on families and communities across the country. So um, here we are opening a new market. Um, it's taken decades of advocacy to bring it into existence. And we feel that it's important to take a little bit of time at the outset to try and triage some of the harm and prioritize people and communities that were most severely harmed by this plant, which we've all now collectively realized we should have never criminalized in the first place. And it's not just the board that feels that this is important. Um, the legislature wrote this priority system directly into our law. Um, they asked us to prioritize and expedite applications um, from people, from communities that have been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition and from people who've been directly impacted. Um, we would literally be in violation of the law if we ignored this directive. And it's not just the legislature that feels this is important. Um, Governor Scott issued a statement when he let this law go into effect, stating that the bill, even with this priority system, did not do enough for the communities that were most negatively affected by cannabis enforcement. He urged the legislature to do more, um, including reducing fees and providing business and technical support. So um, just please, as you're awaiting your license approval, um, please keep in mind the broader context of this moment, the bipartisan directive to the board to embed equity into the foundation of our market, and to know that we will work as quickly as we can to approve as many outdoor cultivator licenses this year so that you can participate in this growing season. And just a quick reminder, other than integrated licenses, we do not have a cap on the number of licenses we can issue like there are in other states. And we've heard some confusion about this point from applicants. There are certain people that we cannot issue licenses to. Um, these are people who have ties to criminal enterprises, people with violent felonies, um, people with recent fraud, deceit, and embezzlement convictions. But um, really, we designed our pre-qualification process to hopefully um, identify these people early before they made any sort of significant capital expenditures. But if you're not disqualified because of one of these events and you can meet the minimum standards that our rules require, the board will give you a license. However, one of these minimum standards relates to your current behavior. Um, there's a difference between someone who has been historically impacted by the war on drugs and someone who's currently flagrantly violating the law and our rules with respect to growing, selling, and advertising. <laughs> Sorry, I uh, lost my spot here. <laughs> um, That's a good point to let sink in. 
One of our priorities is to shift the legacy market into the regulated market, but we cannot look the other way um, on these types of issues. We're jeopardizing the entire industry in Vermont if we ignore the FinCEN guidance and grant licenses to people who are openly violating state and federal law. We're issuing licenses at a good rate. We're about to add more staff. There is a backlog right now, but that backlog is not gonna last forever. However, if you intentionally violate the law while you're waiting for your application to be reviewed, that could impact, uh, that could have a long-term implication on your ability to get licensed. One of our other minimum licensing standards is getting all of your necessary permits from fire safety. I know a lot of the same people tune in every week and I'm a broken record on this point, but we keep getting questions about whether we can waive those um, requirements and we can't. Um, if your place of business is operating in a public building, you need a certificate of occupancy before we can grant you a license. If you're not operating in a public building, we need a letter from fire safety certifying that your location is not a public building. Complying with the building codes is a barrier to entering this market. We know that, um, but the codes are not arbitrary. They're there to protect you, your neighbors, your employees, first responders, um, our inspectors, and anyone else that might be entering your space. Landon Wheeler is your point of contact at the Division of Fire Safety. Um, once again, his email is landon.wheeler at vermont.gov. His cell phone number is 802. 639-0949. He attended our meeting last week um, and walked us through the basic process for getting your certification. That video is up um, on our YouTube page at Vermont CCB, and uh, I'd encourage everyone to just re-watch that video. Um, but here's some of the high-level points he made. He can conduct that threshold inquiry about whether your building is a public building or not, um, relatively quickly, and I think, from what I understand, without a site visit. Um, if you are a public building, you need to apply for a permit, which you can do on the Depart Division of Fire Safety's website, which is firesafety.vermont.gov. Fire Safety has a very good clearance rate. Um, he said that he gets through roughly 95% of their applications within 30 days of them being filed. Um, but he did caution that fire safety did not get any additional staff um, for in the cannabis bill. There's a huge number of new projects um, this year related to cannabis and, and otherwise. Um, so you should engage early. And um, just to be clear, the CCB will not grant you a license until we see one of three documents. Certification that your operation is not in a public building, a certificate of occupancy, or a certificate of conditional occupancy. Um, in other news, uh, S-188 did get signed by the governor. It's now Act 158. Um, it's a miscellaneous bill, meaning that it makes 30 or so changes to the cannabis laws. Most of them are technical and non-substantive. Um, and instead of having Bryn walk us through the bill here, I think we're just gonna post a summary to our website. And then last thing, um, just a reminder that starting next week, our regular board meetings will be shifting to Wednesdays at 1 p.m. So there's no meeting this coming Monday. And other than that, we just have to approve the minutes um, from our last meeting on uh, May 31st. Is there a motion? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. I think, Bryn, this is the part where I turn things over to you. <clears throat> right, so I'm going to start out as I always do with our pre-qualification applications. Um, here are the numbers as of last Friday. Uh, you can see we have 365 that are submitted but incomplete. Um, since our pre-qual window closed on May 31st, that number should not grow um, for the foreseeable future. So today we have 20 uh, before the board that our staff are recommending for pre-qualification. Six of them are cultivators, five are manufacturers, two are wholesalers. 
um, and five are retail. I think those numbers might be a little bit off, um, but let's go through them and we'll find out. So each of um, applicants have demonstrated compliance with Board Rule 1.4.1 and 1.4.2 and have demonstrated themselves to be suitable for pre-qualification. So we have submission 463, um, seeking a retail license, submission 524, seeking a retail license, submission 27, also retail, submission 398B, seeking a tier two manufacturing license, Submission 23, seeking an outdoor tier one cultivation license. Submission number 50, seeking a mixed use cultivation tier one license. Submission 52, seeking a retail license. Submission 80B for a wholesaler license. Submission 157 for a tier two manufacturing license. Submission 310B, seeking a wholesaler license. Submission 310C, seeking a manufacturing tier one license. Submission 405, seeking a retail license. Submission 464, also retail. Submission 586, tier two manufacturing. Submission 346, tier one outdoor cultivation. Submission 338B, tier two manufacturing. Submission 189, tier one indoor cultivation. Um, submission 555, Tier 5 Indoor Cultivation. Submission 583, Tier 1 Indoor Cultivation. And submission number 134 for retail license. Um, so we will, I will, we will correct those numbers um, at the top of the page at the end of the meeting before we post this to our website. Um, I can move on now to talk about our full license applications. Um, unless we want to talk about any concerns about these pre-qual applicants now. I think there was a business name that I had a concern about that was in the pre-qual. Yeah. Um, and I think there's also one in the licensing. Both pre-qual. Both pre-qual. Mm -hmm. So there were two names that I was, that, I mean, they gave me pause, mm -hmm. um, you know, that I think maybe we should have a discussion about them. Um, Fantasia Farms and Sugar Shack were the two that, as I was scrolling through the list of prequel names, that just gave me a little bit of pause. Yeah, and so is the concern that they um, might be appealing to youth? Yes. To say, yeah, yes. Okay. But I and I say this, and that they gave me pause as I was scrolling through, but. Yeah. I'm sort of on the fence about both of them, whether or not that's really, I mean, the word Fantasia existed before Disney yep. made a movie, right? Yep. <laughs> it has a whole other meaning. Right. Um, and then, I, you know, I don't know about sugar. It's not quite like candy. Right. It's not quite as blatant, but um, they both gave me pause. And I wanted to know what you both thought about that. I feel like in a jurisdiction that wasn't Vermont or in this part of the, the country, Sugar Shack would raise more eyebrows than the way that we typically right. think of it, you know, with respect to sugar season and everything going on, um, you know, in the early part of the year. Yeah, I mean, it does have kind of significance in Vermont that it might not otherwise, to Kyle's point. Yeah. So I think I, I could be all right with that one. But I also do think that how they use it might change if they have a lot of candy around it and right. their advertising, you know, that could impact it. So on both of those, I feel like these are both for pre-qualification. I believe so. Just double check that. I know. So good shit. Oh, that's so there we go. So one is up for a full license and that's Fantasia Farm. And did they get pre-qualified, you know, under Fantasia Farm? Um, I do not believe so, but we can double check that. Sugar Shack up. Uh, is Sugar Shack a cultivator or a manufacturer? Do we know? I mean, I'm, so, uh, I don't mean to these are, go down a tradition looking for it. I'm sure we know somewhere. I, don't I, can answer. I mean, I think to your point, Pepper, it does matter how they're used. So maybe right. the guidance to the applicants is these names are okay, but be mindful of these other Right. Ones. I mean, we're going to have a, a sense of how they're going to use them during the kind of packaging process yeah. and the advertising process. So I, I do feel like 
notifying them, like we have other applicants, that this might implicate your ability to use this business name on your packaging is the probably best way to go. So Fantasia Farms has not been pre-qualified um, and the Sugar Shack is up for a mixed use uh, cultivation license okay. pre-qual. Can we send a similar directive letter just indicating that they're at the appropriate time when we are reviewing your labeling, your packaging, et cetera, the Absolutely. use of this name might come, might be implicated. Yep. Okay. Yeah, they're they're cool and clever names. I totally yeah. get what folks are going for, but I think they all just need to be on the same page with respect to how certain folks in the Vermont community could interpret business names like this and, and what it what it signals. So we just need to be careful and maybe a little once we find some bandwidth, we can put out guidance around how and how you can use your name. Yeah. You know. I think that we've kind of covered that a little bit in the labeling yeah. guidance guidance, right? So yes. Gotta communicate it in many different ways. That's right. So folks you can, are correct. You know, that. learn the way that they learn. Good. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> so I'll move on now to the full license application yeah. numbers. <clears throat> um, so we have eight um, up for review today for the board. Uh, one is a testing lab, our first testing lab up for a license, and the rest are cultivation licenses. Five of them are outdoor and two are indoor. It's impressive in and of itself. Just, I, I think if we approve all of these, that brings our number up to 19. That's right. And you know, I know I mentioned in the past, but Massachusetts was was averaging four to six a month um, early on. So you can keep bringing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the following are the staff recommendations for cannabis establishment license. Um, so. As with every week, these are the applicants that have demonstrated compliance with all of the requirements for a cannabis establishment license that's set out both in our rules and in statute. So I'll go through them now. First is Clover Hill Cannabis. Um, staff is recommending approval for an indoor tier one cultivation license um, for this business, an economic empowerment business. Um, Fantasia Farm. Outdoor Tier 1 Cultivator, again, Economic Empowerment Applicant. Third is DBA off Piste Farm, um, seeking Outdoor Tier 1 Cultivation. Um, fourth is Doing Business as Kodiak's Treasure, um, Outdoor Tier 1 Cultivation License. Fifth is Shindig and G's Craft Cannabis, Outdoor Tier 1 Cultivation. Sixth is Duke's Diesel, indoor tier one cultivation. Seventh is Birdlands, LLC, outdoor tier one cultivator. And lastly is Bia Diagnostics. So um, each of these eight applicants has uh, met the criteria for licensure according to staff and we are recommending them for a license. And before we finish, I can we do have one social equity status approval for the board to review. Um, here are social equity license application numbers. Um, a total of 37 as of Friday. Um, so we have one up for approval um, and it's a seeking a testing lab license. Um, submission number 144 and staff are recommending social equity status be granted for this applicant since they meet the criteria for a socially disadvantaged business applicant as, de as defined in board rule. And we have, um, I believe, three recommendations for denial. Um, submission 735, submission 59, and submission 490. Um, and staff is recommending social equity status denial for these three applicants since they each of them don't meet the criteria 
for a social equity individual applicant as defined in board rule. Thank you. Yep. Is there a motion to approve the staff recommendations? The board accept each of the recommendations for pre-qualification, social equity status, and licensing approval included um, in this meeting presented by staff. I'll second. Any discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great, great job. Um, really impressive work. Um, and glad to see the kind of focus on social equity, economic empowerment, and outdoor cultivators. I know that um, people are anxious to get going. So uh, last on our agenda is to open the floor to public comment. Um, we'll handle it the same way we always do, which is um, if you join via the link, please just raise your virtual hand and we'll try and call on you in the order that you've raised your hand. And then um, we'll move to people that join via the phone. First, we have uh, Dolan Dolan. <clears throat> Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. Thanks so much. Um, my name is Jessie Lynn Dolan. I'm a nurse. I specialize in opioid use disorder as well as cannabis plant medicine. Um, appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to us. I do have just a couple comments. I have not been very available for a while because of work to chime in and to listen to a lot of these sessions, unfortunately, but can, been trying to catch up. Um, that also is partly because of some of the frustration and I guess disappointment regarding the medical program and dispensaries here. And I just wanted to circle quickly back to that. As we know, at this point, we still have no mandated testing for any contaminants or in-house THC testing is the only thing that is mandated. There's no education in-house. And we have not had any updates this legislative session or even the medical bill that even got a drop of attention, unfortunately. And we have one of the most restrictive cannabis programs in the United States. So I just wanted to quickly circle us back to that because that is so important. And what I want to mention is the fact that we now have a hemp program, which has higher standards than our adult use program, and a medical program, which has lower standards than both of those programs combined. So in my mind, that's a little bit backwards from what we would want. And I would think, you know, the ultimate goal is here. So with that in mind, I want to mention a few things that the medical program versus the hemp program versus the adult use program is differing in that we maybe need to look at having a little more uniformity, not only for consumer protection and efficacy and financial financial reasons, but, you know, a lot of other reasons we could go into. I won't take the time to do that. Um, one of my most concerning ones is how we distinguish and label our products. I haven't heard any conversation amongst the Cannabis Control Board relating to that. What I would, you know, ask is that we're looking at the hemp labeling laws and how they've done a great job distinguishing distillates versus whole plants. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, I have had zero, I've heard zero conversations regarding these labeling laws from the adult use program here. Um, you know, what I, I really want to impress upon you guys and unfortunately legislators who are not willing to listen, but they are willing to listen to some of the anti-cannabis rhetoric and doctors that we have is that there's a huge difference between distillate and whole plant. And with the THC caps that are not in place, basically what we are doing is increasing intoxication by flooding our endocannabinoid system receptors and increasing our risk of cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. So if we don't, if we have a legislator who doesn't understand the science and are listening to jargon instead of listening to the people that can actually give them the correct information, well, then I feel the Cannabis Control Board's job is going to be, unfortunately, to supersede that with actually proper labeling laws to help our, our consumers. So if we're not labeling a product that is a distillate versus a whole spectrum, that is a very different effect that has on somebody when we're talking and, and thinking about consumer safety and regardless of consumer safety, also financial, you know, concerns and efficacy when purchasing those products. So I really am asking you guys, where are we at with the labeling laws? Are you going to be matching at least the hemp laws, distinguishing that distillate versus whole plant? And at what point 
you know, we're, we're kind of in an interim period here. You guys now own the medical program, but we don't even have a committee that we used to have for symptom relief oversight so that patients are having a voice. It's kind of all stalled. And I completely understand you guys are inundated, have a lot of work, but I don't feel during that time, medical should absolutely get the last conversation and not, you know, be considered and not unfortunately moving forward. I'll reiterate to anyone that's listening, at this point, our medical dispensaries still have no mandated testing for contaminants, yet we have that in adult use. That is the absolute opposite of what we want to seek for consumer safety. So we need to encourage education through our labeling, through education programs, and unfortunately, we're just not seeing that. I do hope we see that sooner than later. Again, this is on legislators more than the Cannabis Control Board, but it does come to you guys to be able to you know, have the ability to hopefully fix some of these labeling laws, fix some of this education, really dive in a little bit stronger into, you know, where are we at with the medical patient um, financial fund right now? No one's talked about that. It's been six months since that has been, you know, unfortunately, I think, kind of left in the back burner based on putting prioritizing adult use. In my mind, the legislators and some medical dispensaries have a fixed agenda. I don't believe you guys do, and I appreciate that. But, you know, if we really want to focus on safety and transparency, if we're not labeling appropriately, we are straight up lying. We're showing that education does not matter. And on that, the last thing I want to say is, speaking of labeling, you guys are really working hard and doing a great job trying to have a diverse and inclusive program. When we label breastfeeding, that is antiquated and that is not inclusive. Um, Perfect example, I'm publishing research right now from the University of Vermont on cannabis and human milk feeding. We published the same study six years ago. It was called marijuana and breastfeeding. Those six years, UVM has recognized it's more important to now call it cannabis and human milk feeding. So I'm hoping you guys will readdress this before labels start being printed to actually be inclusive. Every Wednesday at 10 a.m., I meet with a, a parent who is a female biological, but please do not call them a female or a mom, call them a dad and say they chest fed. They do not want to be called a mom or said that they have breastfed. So I'm asking you guys for inclusion, you know, with our labeling laws, not only for education regarding that consumer safety, that transparency, when we're looking at distillate versus isolate versus whole plant products, but also for our parenting out there to really look at having some language that is a little more up to date in 2022 and not having language that is so antiquated as far as breastfeeding. So um, I think that's everything I wanted to say. My real hope, I guess, guys, is that next year there's going to be a huge push to work on medical because it has been, you know, a bit a bit frustrating to watch this process and watch all this work and time and effort done to the adult market, which we absolutely need. But, you know, patients are definitely being left on the wayside, whether that's legislatively you know, their agenda and what they're bringing forward. But just as a patient and a caregiver and a nurse educator want to kind of circle us all back to that and remember how important that is in connection with the adult use. And lastly, if you guys really are concerned about, you know, some of the rhetoric, some of the doctors are speaking to as far as intoxication and cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, the two things I will recommend is we should be moving forward looking at terpene testing as mandated along with cannabinoid testing because we know intoxication is not just from, from the cannabinoids. That is very clear. The science dictates that very well and clear. So if that's something we can look at, um, you know, that would also be appreciated. So again, thank you guys for your time. I know I've just kind of thrown a lot at you, but haven't been available for a while to speak. Um, And again, just really want to circle us back to where this all started. And that was with supporting patients and helping patients. And we need to kind of somehow bring that back into prioritization. Um, If not now, you know, ASAP once legislative session gets running and I'm hope you hope you guys will help us as patients and caregivers hit the floor running with that. So so thank you very much. Thanks, Jesse Lynn. Okay, organics. Hi, this is Greta with OK Organics. Um, I just wanted to touch on the I, I guess it's the economic empowerment status of applications. I see today that you approved a couple that were could classified as general or standard. So I'm just wondering what happened to the rest of the social equity and or economic empowerment. Um, I was under the impression that women-owned businesses 
we're in that economic empowerment category, which I am, um, and my application from what I can see has not moved from the submitted category, which um, I submitted 46 days ago and it's number 24. Um, so I'm just a little confused, I guess, at the order now that you've moved on to general and standard. Um, and it seems like some that we're supposed to have priority over that haven't even been looked at yet. That's all. Thanks. Thanks for that. Red Clover Analytics. Yes. Hello. Uh, you need plenty. Yes. Red Clover Analytics. Uh, once again, I want to thank the board for all the efforts that they've been doing towards uh, the, this program. Um, and I do want to repeat some of the things that Jessalyn uh, just said. Uh, always great to hear from her. Uh, like I said a few weeks ago, uh, we haven't heard anything from the medical program. Uh, we haven't heard any any movement from that side of things. Yeah, we keep hearing from the recreational side of things. But uh, again, uh, one of my biggest concerns with uh, opening up uh, the testing lab was uh, to you know provide that that security uh, for patients. Um, but nonetheless. Uh, the other thing I wanted to touch on is the THC caps. Um, with the THC caps, uh, a lot of things, uh, a big thing that I've been learning uh, lately is that no concentrate, uh, if it's worth this money, it's going to come out, out of the plant uh, below 60%. Um, and the reason I want to touch on that is because uh, I've talked to a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, prospective customers who are willing to uh, give up their data to, uh, to quantify those things for you guys so you can take into the select board. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it's one of the things that uh, I wanted to touch with you is uh, the ability to be able to offer that data for you guys to uh, present and use uh, because again, a lot of this product is gonna come up above 60%. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Yerm. So anyone else that joined via the link, please raise your virtual hand if you'd like to make a public comment. Um, and then if you joined by the phone, you can hit star six to unmute yourself. All right. Well, um, really appreciate everyone who joined all the public comments. Um, you know, the medical program is always kind of on our minds and we do need to kind of think about the direction that we're going to go there. And certainly, Jesse Lynn, you've helped uh, kind of clarify some of the, the issues that need to be addressed. Um, so um, thank you all for joining. Thanks for the public comments. Um, thank you to our staff for uh, just plugging away at these applications um, and just sort of final reminder that our next meeting is next Wednesday um, at 1 p.m., not Monday. Um, and we will record it and live stream it as well. Thanks again, and I will adjourn this meeting.